Hello, and welcome to another SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you for joining us, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our viewers from around the world. Please let us know in the comments where you are watching from. Today, I am joined by Dr. Peter Yeniskins, uh, my SETI Institute mentor for my internship, so I'm so happy to have him here. Uh, his project, the Cameras for All Sky Meteor Surveillance, uh, went online back in 2009, and it started with three locations and 24 cameras each, and we had to manually identify all of these different meteors, and it was a lot of work and very intense and involved um, shuffling hard drives back and forth. Times have changed, things have improved, and and since the beginning, we have you have now done this amazing job and and pulled in so many other people to to help basically automate your pipe your data pipeline so that's what we want to talk about we want to talk about the automation and we want to talk about this brand new version of the website that you you guys have introduced and just gone live with uh so peter tell us about cams tell us why we have cams and what you're doing with it yeah so today uh today's purpose really is to um introduce a, a, a very cool tool, not so much uh, telling you whether something is a meteor. So the, you know, the title of the talk, is that a meteor? But more, what meteor is that? If you see a shooting star in the sky, uh, can you tell where it's coming from? Mm -hmm. Can you tell where it belongs to? And uh, a, a group of people brought together by uh, uh, Sita Ganyu has really done an incredible job in uh, creating a tool that allows you, when you're in a field, looking up at the sky, seeing shooting stars, to tell what that is. What did I just see? Uh, we're not talking about big, bright fireballs. We're talking about, you know, your regular shooting stars you see when you go out in a summer's night. For example, in August, when you have the Perseids, uh, you know, there's always a lot of interest in that shower because there's a lot of them. and uh, they, are, they are nice to watch, especially in the evening when they come in grazing and they make long tracks in the sky. Uh, but uh, when you're watching the Perseids, there are other showers in the skies. There's other things going on. There's a lot of different streams of particles coming to the Earth. They're all hitting the Earth's atmosphere. They're all glowing up brightly. And, uh, and that's uh, what you're seeing when you're uh, looking up the sky. So a meteor is a glow. <laughs> um, a meteorite would be if something survives, if you have a rock that falls on the ground and it would be captured. And uh, part of what we're trying to do is catch the events where that happens. And then you're talking big bright fireball and collecting a rock on the ground. Uh, most of the meteors we're seeing are not that bright. Or, or, you know, the, the brightness you're seeing with the naked eye. And uh, those meteors you can uh, perfectly film with um, video security cameras. And uh, you know, this is one of them. This is sort of cameras that we are using to catch these shooting stars in the sky. And we have boxes and boxes full of them. Um, it's indeed, it started very small, uh, but it gradually grew out into a bigger effort here in California. I'm talking about Mountain View. Um, but then it grew out into this international effort where uh, we were trying to cover all of the sky, all the time. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, when it's night, uh, we would have cameras out and they would be filming the stars and they would uh, basically film these meteors. And then when you were part of this program, that, uh, you know, you had to go through all that data and you had to manually check each triangulation because that's what mm -hmm. we're doing. We have two of these cameras. We're, we're then triangulating where the track is in the atmosphere and what direction it's coming from. And you had to check and see, uh, you know, which was a meteor, which was a plane, which was something else. Was it good? If it's good, then it was accepted. And so we very gradually then built up this big database with orbits. Well, these days, you know, fortunately, that isn't necessary anymore. Uh, everything is now submitted online um, to a general server. Uh, the data are then processed automatically. And uh, the data are then uh, very quickly reduced and very quickly showed uh, online. In the old days, you know, it took weeks, if not mm -hmm. months, to get. If not months, <laughs> yeah. Months. <laughs> These days, you know, uh, you can actually see the results from last night 
uh, on screen. And I'll, sh I'll show you where that magic happens. So I'm in my office here at the SETI Institute. I'll do a little tour around. So this is my uh, my new office since we've moved here. Uh, behind me, you can see there are some uh, PCs set up to do the reduction of spectra. So we are actually catching also uh, some meteors where we are uh, where we're basically putting the light of the meteor part in its colors and then uh, can tell from the lines what uh, what uh, is what is in that meteoroid, what sort of uh, main elements are there. So we do that in California, and uh, that's an effort going on. And here on the, near the door of my office is, uh, is a PC sitting there that uh, shows, that is basically the PC that uh, processes the, the CAMS results. And so uh, let me go and take a seat here for a second. This is our, uh, our PC, this is the, this is the tool that we developed early on to give a sense on, uh, you know, what, uh, you know, what uh, data we had. Uh, and uh, you see here the sun, you see this is sort of a rotating sphere. And uh, you can see all the points in, on this sphere that tells us the direction from which a meteor is coming. And it's this tool that has been uh, greatly uh, modified and greatly enhanced. And it's now really very cool. Uh, piece of equipment for you to use, so that so that if you're interested in meteor showers, if you're out in, uh, I, you see a meteor go through the through the, between the stars, uh, you can track it back and you can figure out uh, you know from which of these different meteor showers it belongs. All right. Well, how many? Just out of curiosity, do you know off the top of your head how many countries you have cameras in now? Um. I would uh, I can make a list. So we have a network set up here in the United States, uh, in California, mm -hmm. in Arizona, the low camps network, in Arkansas, uh, in Texas, uh, in Florida, and in the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, we have a network in the Netherlands. It's a distributed network where lots of amateur uh, citizen scientists, amateur astronomers are participating. They each have, each have one camera or a few cameras. And then all that data is pulled together, and then uh, together that gives uh, the capability to do triangulation. So that's a, that's a Benelux network. And uh, very excitingly, uh, we um, we had cameras in Belgium, we had cameras in the Netherlands, but we didn't have cameras in Luxembourg yet. <laughs> but as of uh, you know a few days ago, uh, Luxembourg is now officially part of the Benelux. Oh, congrats! So, uh, so we're now really back comes Benelux. And then, of course, there is a network in uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, run by Mohammed Odi at the International Astronomical Center in Abu Dhabi. Uh, it's, a, it's a great network. It sits right on the other end of the earth than California is. So it's, it's there in that direction. <laughs> and uh, it's uh, covering the sky, you know, when it's daylight here. And uh, we, are, we are covering the sky when it's daylight in, uh, in Abu Dhabi. So... Um, so yeah, we're covering the sky. We also have uh, since 2019 networks in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, it started with a small network in New Zealand. Um, then uh, that network got uh, expanded. It's now a full network around uh, Christchurch in, uh, on the South Island. Uh, we have a network in South Africa around Johannesburg run by Tim Cooper, who is long the uh, director of the ASA meteor section. Uh, he's running network there. And uh, there's now really nice networks in uh, Australia, in, in, in uh, near Perth, run by Curtin University, and uh, in Chile, run by Serra uh, Tololo, uh, Aura, uh, Noir Lab, and also uh, the La Silla Observatory, uh, run by the University of Liege. And then uh, we have a nice network in Namibia. And the Namibia network is incredible. It's, it's counting for about a quarter of all the meteors being, being captured, uh, thanks to every night clear weather. <laughs> it's just the wow. perfect site for this. And so, uh, yeah, so they have been very successful. And altogether, uh, it uh, gives us uh, a very nice overview of meteor showers on the Southern Hemisphere, on the Northern Hemisphere. 
Uh, we are even, um, because we are uh, observing the sky uh, until just before the sun comes up, we can uh, peek to very close to the sun. Mm -hmm. So we don't see uh, necessarily see the daylight showers in the direction where the sun is itself, uh, but we can see quite a, quite a ways in that direction. And so we're, we're covering almost all of the sky. And so, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. And as I said, if you see a meteor in the sky, we can probably tell you where it's coming from. And we can also, and that's another real cool feature of this tool, we can also tell you what there's going to be tonight. Because you can go a year back, it's an archive, you can go a year back, and then uh, you can uh, check that date in the year um, and see what showers are active. And of course, you can also do that on your birthday or, you know, an other, other favorite day that you might have. Uh, to sort of get a sense on, uh, you know, what, what's coming towards us. It's really looking at the sky in a very different way than, than people are used to. So instead of seeing stars and the lights coming to us, uh, we see all the these little particles, these little bits, specks of debris from comets and from asteroids uh, coming towards the Earth at incredible speeds and zipping into the atmosphere and, and giving all these bright lights Fantastic. Well, let's let's talk to some of the people who have made this new website happen. Yes. Thank you, Peter. Um, we'll have you back on in a little bit to uh, answer audience questions. Um, before I bring on our next person, I want to welcome people who are watching from it, it is it is a global audience. Um, everybody who's watching in the USA, you have listed almost every state. Uh, we have people watching from Amsterdam, Portugal, Berlin, Australia, England, Germany. Uh, wow. Um, Louisiana, I mean, it, every state and, and so many countries, Canada, we've got Canada, South Africa, uh, the Netherlands. Wow. Mexico. Oh my gosh. You guys are just watching from every Poland. Oh, thank you. Thank you everybody for, for tuning in. This is so awesome. And I'm so glad you all are here. I'm going to bring on our next guest, Peter, once again, thank you so much. We'll see you in a few moments. All right, joining me now is Amartya. Amartya, tell us who you are and what you do and how you worked on this new website. Hello, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Amartya and I work for a financial services company in Boston. And uh, I work here with uh, CAMS uh, as a citizen scientist. I'm working for the last one and a half year here. And I, mm, with the help of other members, I try to develop this one. And this is a very interactive uh, material shower portal. And you can find a lot of things here, such as you can set your um, observation location first, and then the date. Now, as Peter said, uh, this is very uh, real time. So you can, you can see the last night sky and you can see the uh, what happened last night uh, in the sky and you you can see different uh, yeah those those are highlighted those are constellation if you know the structure you you can you can find them uh, with the with the names and these constellations are very important because this constellation uh, give us the direction from which the meteors are coming to coming towards the, towards us actually. Now you can see there are different colors of meteors uh, on the on the map, and these colors represent the uh, speed of the meteors. So if you see the blue color, blue color is the least speed of meteors, and if you go towards green then yellow orange and red and the color uh, and the speed is gradually increasing if you if you see there are a lot of white colored meteor as well those are sporadic meteors and if you click some uh, any of the meteor um, you you can yes those information are coming the those are like uh, the name of the meteor and four very important features such as uh, the velocity, solar longitude, uh, and ecliptic longitude and latitude. So with this, um, 
information, this, this information are coming from the camera, which Peter mentioned earlier. The camera is seeing the night sky and it's observing the moving lights or any kind of um, incident is happening. So the camera is capturing important features and the, those data and features are going through several rounds of pre-processing, data cleaning, and so many other steps. And they're going to fit into a deep learning model. We are using here a bidirectional LSTM, which is basically uh, taking care of the sequence of information uh, is, got, uh, is getting from the cameras. And it's predicting whether it's a meteor or not. So basically the camera is seeing some moving light in night sky and the bidirectional LSTM or the classifier is saying whether it's a meteor or not. If it is a meteor, you can see it here uh, in the next, next day morning. And other than uh, just predicting, we have gone one step ahead to analyze the data where we are, we are trying to understand what the machine is learning from there, what the uh, model is learning from the data. So we have used some attention-based model and we have seen there's a very interesting data pattern for meteors. Uh, so if we visualize them, we, we have found a very uh, nice distribution of data. While the non-meteors are very discrete set of pattern we got. So which gives us confidence that the way we are seeing the meteors in normal eyes, naked eyes, and the way um, the deep learning model is interpreting is somewhere there, there is a symmetry and that gives us a confidence uh, as well as we have seen the results and accuracy is really good. And that's why we, we have given here the result uh, showed in this website. So that's more or less my work and my contribution to this project. Uh, over to you, Beth. All right. Well, thank you, Amartya. Um, the website is amazing. And I, I was playing with it last night and just kind of enjoying being able to sort of spin the, the globe around and, and get all the different information. So, yeah. you know, thank you. Thank you so much. And also, uh, from the bottom of my heart, from someone who had to sit and and actually manually mark whether or not something was a meteor, thank you, <laughs> because that was very time consuming, and I'm sure yeah, that, is. that is so much easier now that that someone doesn't have to actually do that. So thank you so much for all of your hard work on that. Thank you. All right, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna have let's see. Now I'm going to have uh, Chicheng join me. Thank you again, Amartya. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I if we have questions for you later, I'll have you back on. So hold on just a bit. All right. All right. Hi, Chicheng. Thanks for joining us. Hello. Um, Hi, tell Beth. everybody yeah. who you are and what you do on the website. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. So my name is Chichen, and I'm currently working as a software engineer from a uh, company named like uh, Block uh, in California. So basically, I joined the camp project like uh, over a year now, and I'm really uh, mainly responsible for the backend development for the entire website. Um, so uh, this is also like the, the main topic I'm going to walk through. Like, uh, so why do we actually need to bring this like a backend service and how it plays a role in this like a new camps website? So basically mm -hmm. the reason why we are trying to introduce a new service like to hold all the, uh, all the new like uh, a star or media data is because um, we feel like we uh, just some could be some, uh, a room for improvement. Uh, on the old website because like the user experience is not that great. Something could be a bit laggy. Um, and uh, overall, like uh, uh, we feel like maybe like a kind of like a revamp kind of user ex experience will help uh, us like to uh, observe so it's like a mere immediate data and also try to visualize it. So that's the original kind of like uh, initiative, like uh, why uh, we're trying to introduce a new pipeline like to process all the incoming data. And one of the reason that makes the original kind of experience uh, a little bit uh, and challenging to use is because the the raw data processing because what we did originally is that like we kind of like a surface all the raw data for the 
browser like to process, uh, which is definitely like very time consuming and resource consuming. So uh, with this like a new service like uh, running, we're trying to figure out a more efficient way to do that. So that's the whole point of, of like setting up a new like a backend service. So our, in our new pipeline flow, uh, we're essentially trying to like consume all the like raw data generated from all the station uh, and feed it into our new backend service. And then like we, we're trying to normalize the data in a way that can be easily fit into a very mature data storage layer and like actually having this storage layer opens up a lot of uh, like opportunity to uh, like a, a increased efficiency in uh, in terms of like the, the data query, right? Because like we can better categorize the data in our database, and it, like having those things like already in the database also makes it possible for us like to easily aggregate the data together. So um, this this is where we actually solve like the data query and aggregation layer, and on top of that, we actually like build another uh, another layer, which is the the web server layer, which essentially like serves those data back uh, to the to the public web uh, to the public web, and this layer of APIs is, is actually being used by the website itself. So this is how you can see like all the visualized like points on on the globe. So um, Yes, so um, those uh, so basically when this website like uh, starts right, uh, it will make like several requests like to our backend service like retrieving all those data uh, uh, using those API calls, and and with those API uh, we also like to find a few like parameters where you can actually customize your query. Say like uh, you can uh, specify the date uh, where the data will come from, or maybe like like the, the location. Uh, you want to filter, right? So having this like API layer really makes all the uh, all the requests very flexible to deal with. Um, yeah. So um, and and also with the new web server running, right? So we finally introduce a very like automatic pipeline, meaning that uh, with all the daily refresh kind of kind of data like coming in. The web server can automatically like uh, recognize those files and then trying to parse all the data and uh, automatically like feed it into the uh, like a SQL data uh, our like database layer which is like uh, based on SQL and this uh, uh, this um, introduce a, a less kind of like a um, like a manual effort that we need to like uh, say mainly like copy data over. Um, so this is a very like sustainable way, like how we want to manage a large chunk of data using the web server. So, so this is like the main kind of functionality of the uh, backend service, where it first like uh, uh, has the automatic like, pipeline running, like consumes the data, and also have a la uh, API layer which expose those like a uh, uh, re uh, data for for the other client to to consume. Uh, for example, like the the camp's website itself. And having actually like this, like a web server running, right? We actually uh, also introduce like other opportunity to build more kind of like a, a very exciting uh, features on top of that. So for example, like with all the data, like uh, data available to this server, we can actually help you like to create uh, create like a, sc a screenshot. I'm just like naming a few, like some possible features like to the website. So having this web server running, uh, it actually introduce a infinite possibility of like how we want to utilize like this data. So this is definitely like a huge step over uh, the original way when like the browser is trying to ro uh, process ro those raw file. It's pretty difficult like, to build more features on top of that. So okay. yeah, this so 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 this is this website is definitely a step up from the previous iteration, which is sort of what Peter was showing us earlier, where we had the, the white screen with the, the blue globe on it. And now so what you're saying is that you can actually build onto this one more easily. This is this is going to be a bit more dynamic than the previous website mm -hmm. was. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, we have well, a, that is yeah. that is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely. What were you about to say? Oh uh, no, uh, I'm just saying like uh, um 
uh, with like more like data, more like structural right, like story, right? We not only like space the uh, space so that like uh, we don't have to deal with the uh, because like uh, uh, having those data feed into the database will make the data storage more efficient. So that we, like we don't really need to store those like raw text data, uh, which mm -hmm. uh, could be like a, a a problem in the future if like our data set gets huge. So this is like definitely uh, um, like a, a huge improvement over uh, over like the old uh, the old like kind uh, site uh, experience. And and considering how many uh, meteor data sets you're collecting every night all the time that mm -hmm. there this is a substantial pipeline uh to manage exactly yes all right um well thank you so much to cheng for for joining us today and for talking about that um thank you so much and uh good luck with developing more and interesting uh, mm -hmm. uh things for this website to do so um yeah Thank you again. Thank you, Bess, for having right. me. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to bring on our next person. I want to welcome people from, I saw a few more, uh, Belgium, Italy, and Australia. So a few more countries coming in. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Sahadri to our, our stream. So uh, thank you for joining us. Tell everybody who you are and what you do. Um, so hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sahadri. And... I'm currently working as an astrophysics PhD student at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, but I joined the CAMS team when I was an undergraduate student in India. And I joined the team because Siddha was looking for somebody who could uh, help work on the pipeline and kind of help the expansion of the network and the CAMS network to the Eastern hemisphere of the world. And so my two main tasks were making the constellations that you see in the portals and um, improving the CAMS AI pipeline. And the, the, for the, if, to understand why we need the constellations, we need to understand what they are first. And it's, they are the constellations are the famous patterns that you can kind of see in the night sky by joining stars with imaginary lines. And the patterns called asterisms often take the shape of like various creatures and beings from many mythologies. And People have used these constellations for like for indicators of seasons. They've used them to navigate in the sea while in the oceans. And from the perspective of astronomers, they help us locate objects in the night sky, such as meteors. And Amartya had rightly mentioned that that meteor showers, that constellations essentially tell you the direction in which meteor showers come from. And specifically, if you trace back all the meteors from the meteor showers to a single point in the night sky that point is called the radiant. And that radiant lies within a patch of the sky, which contains a constellation. And astro in astronomical terms, we usually define those patches of skies as the constellations. And you identify the meteor and its radiant by which constellation it lies in. Mm. And so if you want to, if you want a portal like the CAMS portal to help in identifying new meteors or, or, finding existing ones, you need constellations as references. And so that's what I got about to doing. And normally it should be a very simple thing. You just draw some lines on the CAMS portal and it's that's it. But the thing is the, the portal, the little canvas, the globe canvas that you can see even behind me, it rotates every day by a small amount. Mm -hmm. And so it so what I did was I decided to make a code for that, to account for that. And I use Python, but you could reasonably use any other language. In the world and what i did was i made a set i use this python to make a set of instructions for any web page to on where to draw the constellations and how to draw them essentially and i first use a template from github which tells me what the what stars belong in constellations and the rough sequence in which they need to be drawn to form those various stick figures and then i converted those into coordinates for stars, converted that into coordinates that are used by the CAMS portal, and then finally gave it instructions as to how to draw them on the con on the portal. And I made another script, which allows the constellations to move a little bit each day. So what my script does is it tracks how much the stars within the portal have changed every day. So they may 
change by a small amount or a slightly larger amount. And I track the difference between the positions of the stars on two given days, and I shift the constellations by that much because the constellations are defined by the little stars between which you draw the lines. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I these scripts, when you use them together, can be used to make constellations for any other project as well. They're pretty general purpose. And the other part was making up or was modifying the pipeline. Now, CAMS is like a big company, essentially, in, in the way it functions. It's you have a division of labor and you're dividing that labor onto many pieces of code or for a company and em employees. And the end goal of all of these employees or scripts is to one is to, depending on each other to function, but also to ultimately for CAMS to segregate meteors from non-meteors. That's the main objective. Right. And so a pipeline is basically just a large body of code that connects several of these other smaller pieces of code. And so the CAMS pipeline, it takes some data from the CAMS network, all the different cameras, uh, cleans up the data a little bit. Uh, then it uses the AI modules to infer meteor versus non-meteor. And then writes, modifies the data, and then finally uploads them onto the SETI network. So it's kind of like the glue to the whole process of detect, identifying media from non media. Uh, and the thing was, it was already there when I joined the project, but I was tasked with making it go a bit faster or to improve its performance. And so I kind of tried to identify what the bottlenecks for its performance are. And one of them was something called a nested loop. It's basically all programming languages use loops as a basic function to perform any sort of rep repetition. So if you want mm -hmm. to add a number, n number of times or print something n a million times, you use a loop. And a nested loop is a loop inside a loop. Now, the, the way CAMS works is it uses these loops to match few pieces of data into distinct sets, sets mm -hmm. and tries to perform maths on them, basically meddle around with them a little bit. And, and it and what happens is in Python or any other programming language, doing that is a very slow process. So what I tried to do is I replaced many of these nested loops with a Python module called NumPy. And it's it's a very well-optimized code, which a module which has been used in some of the biggest space science projects. And specifically, I use it in my own research every day. It's, it's a workhorse for all of... Uh, all of data science and astrophysics and it, it was definitely of one of the one of the modules we were required to add when i was in undergrad yes right. <laughs> <laughs> and there were other modules that i could have tried and used but uh this one of numpy offers the best tang most tangible benefit and one that scales with the amount of data you give that cams can provide mm -hmm. and so what i did was i tried to replace as many sections as i could with could with numpy operations and arrays while making sure that the code is still readable, because at the end of the day, somebody else also needs to modify the code that I make. Do you, and, do you comment your code well? I, I just, I have uh, to ask. Well, I do at the end of a project, but <laughs> otherwise that's a little too late for that you end up losing track of what you did before. So it's very important to comment, comment, comment. <laughs> and so, yeah, after I, replaced a few lines of code, made the code shorter even. Uh, I tested the pipeline and I ran it on a bunch of data from different dates that CAMS had collected from somewhere from 2010 all the way to this year. And mm -hmm. I, I tried different chunks of si The data was different sizes. So some dates, a lot of meteors had been detected, some not many. Right. And what I'd seen was my modifications improved the runtime or made it faster by 50%. Wow. And, and the thing is, it it doesn't matter how much, how large the chunks of data you're providing, that improvement stays the same. So it scales pretty well with the amount of data. And that's important because the ambition of CAMS is to kind of expand to other places as well. And more data will come in as it does that. So mm -hmm. I think I've, I may have helped in preparing it to handle that efficiently. It, it certainly sounds like you did. And again, my thanks for making it so that I don't have to pick out individual meteors versus planes. Um, that is, that is fantastic. And, and I am also deeply respectful of anybody who can code. I am, I am, I am okay at it, but it is not my, it is not a joy in my life. So, so good for you. And thank you so much for, for handling all of that. All right. Um, it is, it is time to talk to our next person. So, uh, 
Sahyadri, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for joining us today and for talking about your work on the CAMS website. Um, I am now gonna bring on Sita. Sita, Sita, who's been here with us many, many a time. You are subbing in for chat, who unfortunately was unable to make it to our stream at the last minute, um, things happen. But you are gonna talk to us about the user interface design and how amazing this website is to, to use. And, and seriously, I continue to be having so much fun with this site. So, yes. so tell us about sort of the front end of it, the user interface part. Yes, and I actually wanna take everybody on a little behind the scenes sneak peek. So for that, I will ask Yasmin to allow me to share my screen. All right, let me unshare mine. While you're while you're doing that, right. I'm gonna go back and, and let's see, we've got people from, oh, someone has joined from Texas. I don't see any more countries, but more states. Oh, hey, there, I missed someone from the Canary Islands. I am so sorry, thank you for watching. And, and someone who is up in Redwood Valley, California within driving distance of the Allen Telescope Array. Wow. You should go visit. You should go visit it. All right. So what are we looking at here? All right. So this is, you know, um, it was, I want to say, June, July 2020. It was the pandemic. We were all kind of sitting around, socially isolated, of course. And we were thinking, let's pick up the CAMS project once again, and let's do a deep dive reduce some of the technical debt and improve the quality of the website a little bit. And in that process, we found two incredible UX UI experts, um, Chad Rofi and Jesse, and I am subbing in for Chad right now. And so they took us on this incredible journey of which this is kind of the behind the scenes peak where they really showed us what all is possible just by simple design tweaks and you know as a data scientist as someone who is basically just looking at an editor and coding i don't usually think about the design or the ui aspect of things and i think this this really helped make our website much more beginner friendly and a lot more intuitive than we had before. So I'm just gonna go over a few of our original mockups and where we are today. So in the beginning, this is the website that we had put together back in 2017. Um, it was a rough, very rough website where we, we had certain latitude and longitude indicators, which are these horizontal and vertical lines but we didn't have the actual number associated with them. We had information of which meteor ID, the speed or the angle at which it's entering the Earth's atmosphere. And we did this for a bunch of meteors that were already known at that point in time. For example, this blue dots are indicated by meteor number 17, which is the IAU number for that meteor. And so this was a relatively simplistic website. It was also, when building this, we incurred a little bit of technical debt, which we wanted to undo. And so we started with improving the designing side. And as you can see, the design here is relatively more modern, but it's also simple in the sense that you can easily see what is going on, how the meteors are, what are the latitude and longitude numbers associated? And at the bottom, you can see uh, some sort of a video timeline that occurs. And these were some additional features that we added on to the previous website. So now as we progress, you can see, you know, we added options for looking at data from different locations all around the world, the ability to see the same data either in a visual spherical format or in a tabular format selection of the date and also um, just trying to understand as a beginner how do you know how to use the website so we added a few instructional um, 
uh, instructions on the website as well. And then finally, we reached the stage where, you know, this is what our kind of website looks like right now. We refined on how you can select these meteors, get more information about them. Um, the speed indicators through color, how the website would look like on a mobile device, um, how it would look differently on a laptop or a computer and so on. And so, you know, we kind of, throughout all this time, we incurred these changes. And finally, this is what our website looks like today. And one really cool feature that I want to point out is this video timeline feature. Now, the reason why this feature is important is because when we load the website, you can see a bunch of different things. You can see the meteors that are colored. You can see the stars, which are these little black dots. You can see these constellations. You can see the latitude and longitude numbers. And you can also rotate the website here and there and move it around. But what you don't really see is how these patterns of meteors change over time. And as you can imagine, the Earth moves around in space. All the other objects in space also move around. So time is definitely one of the huge components that affects the meteors that we see today versus the meteors that we see tomorrow. So we added two main things to the website to make sure that we can see this gradual change with time. One of those features are these arrows right here. And as you go to a previous date, you will see both the constellations, the stars, as well as the meteors change. And all of this data is loaded from right now, it's all locations, which is aggregated from all the places in the world that have a cam station. But if we were to go individually to, let's say, Australia, these are the meteors that were observed in the Australian um, uh, cams cameras. And so you can go back and forth on these as well. Then if I go back to all locations, you know, you can go back and forth as much as you want. And I believe right now we have data from at least the past few years. So you can go back in history a lot. Now, the other feature that I think was really cool is we added a video timeline feature. So what this does is once you select the start date and the end date, you will see a video pop up here. So let me go back to the time of the Geminids of last year, which will be in December. And Geminids are usually one of the biggest showers that we have observed. And of course, Peter can uh, keep me right on the technical aspects of that. But once you load the start and the end date and you just play it, so you see this green section kind of grow up and reduce over time. And so these are the Geminids and this tool is really, really helpful when communicating this information to an audience that isn't necessarily uh, a meteor scientist or an astronomer. And one of the key things while developing this website and adding all the features was to make sure that we aid Peter and his team and all of the CAMS team in scientific communication. And so that's what we've been trying to do here. And I'm happy to go into any other features of the website. All right, fantastic. Thank you. I, I did not, I hadn't played with the video timeline feature. So thank you for walking me through that because now I'm, I want to, I want to go play with that one. Yeah. Um, all right. We've, we've got a few questions. I'm going to, I'm going to bring Peter on here um, and see if we have, let's see. Uh, Peter, um, James Beecham asks, I'm looking to replace the camera with a more sensitive one. So I think he's he's an old time cams person. He's he's had a cams camera for a while, but he wants to replace his camera with somewhat with a newer one. Do you have a suggestion for him? Um, 
so the uh, the next generation of cameras we are, we were still using the uh, uh, NTSC and pan analog cameras which are based on CCD cameras uh, since that time, uh, a CMOS type camera has come out in high definition, and uh, you can uh, use those cameras as well. Uh, there is a, a, another network uh, that was uh, developed recently called the Global Media Network uh, that has developed software to use that type of cameras. And those cameras are CAMS compatible. So if you set up a camera, you can submit that data to the CAMS, web, uh, CAMS server, and then it's being processed. Uh, together with all the, the CAMS data and the results you're getting. So that would be the way to go in the future. So we're hoping also for CAMS itself to develop uh, a software uh, that uh, would be able to handle these high definition type cameras, uh, but that will be, that's a project for the future. All right, and then kind of along the same lines, uh, Soliton is asking, what is the model number of that camera? The one that you showed earlier uh, um, yes, those are uh, Watek cameras, the, specifically the, the Watek Watt 902H2 Ultimate. It's a specific type. It has a half an inch diameter uh, sensor. Um, and those cameras are the most sensitive in terms of uh, you know, sensitivity for, the, for that type. Okay, great. And then I, I, I am curious about this, this last question here. Do mega constellations of satellites affect your work at all? Do you are are you seeing like Starlink trains in your data? Do oh, those yes. come up as uh, things you have to deal with? The answer is yes, we're seeing them, but the answer is no, we're not having too much problems with it because uh, SIDA's uh, efforts are helping read read a lot of that out. The satellites are a lot higher up than the meteors are. As a matter of fact, we are here on the ground, uh, better positioned to see meteors. They're closer to us than they are to most satellites in orbit. And so um, so the satellites are not uh, necessarily a, a problem. Oh, that's good to know. So right. I, I wanted to uh, 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 go a little bit on uh, how would people actually use this? So you're, you're in a field, you're watching the skies, and you're seeing a shooting star. So how can you use this uh, tool to, uh, to decide what you just saw? So if, if Jasmine can bring up the website, just go to last night's data. Okay, so so here's the here's the site as it looks, um, and uh, you've just spotted a meteor. Now you need to know a little bit about uh, the directions in the sky, so you do need to you know um, get your basics on the constellations. Uh, so uh, uh, Jasmine, can you find uh, Orion, for example, which is right at the, close to the center there? That, that thing there is the constellation of Orion, which has the belt with the three stars, and then Betelgeuse, Rigel, so a, a number of bright stars in the sky, sort of at the part of the, you know, the big winter uh, hexagon. Uh, the, the red meteors on the side there uh, are the Orionids. And they're called Orionids because at the peak of the shower in October, uh, the constellation is, uh, the, the shower comes from the constellation Orion. So if you see a meteor in Orion and it's moving from Betelgeuse, you know, uh, to the southwest, then it's uh, tracked back to the red points. Then you know you've just saw an Orionid. And Orionids are little specks of dust from Comet Halley. I don't know if you, people may be familiar with this, big comet, very bright. Sort of history. If the meteor, on the other hand, moves a bit slower, and it goes uh, from Betelgeuse to the uh, what is it uh, southeast, then uh, you can trace it back, and then it's coming from the blue points. And the blue points are in the constellation Taurus, and they're called the Taurids. And uh, if you can zoom in, can you zoom in on the on that area, Jasmine? Is there a way to? Yeah, there we go. Uh, keep going. So I'm actually very excited about a little uh, white blob there sitting right next to the, because that could be a new shower. <laughs> new showers show up as white blobs in our data. Yeah, that thing there. So we'll Peter, Peter yeah. why don't you give an example of the showers that we did find, new showers that we did find through CAMS? Oh, uh, a, a lot of them. A lot of a them. Lot of, I found yeah. one. <laughs> 
a lot Yay. of shows were found when uh, when we started really in, in earnest mapping the skies because yeah. before camps there were just the photography uh, data and it was very sparse. You just had a few orbits for each night and that's just not enough to see these. And visual observers have tried to uh, map these, to find these showers by by plotting all the meteor tracks on these ch star charts. I used to do that. That's how I started meteor astronomy. I loved it. I mean, you lay on a reclining lawn chair, you have your star charts in front of you. And every time when you see a meteor, you know, you figure out where it is in the constellation and then you plot it on your star charts. And then later you can sort of look for uh, if there are these radiation points, these points where everything is radiating from. And the blue blobs here are those radiants, are those radiating points. So the toroids would radiate from those two areas. The southern one is called the southern toroids, and the, the top one is that one is called the northern toroids. By the way, this website is also very cool because if you click on one of these points, it takes you to Ian Webster's website that shows the meteoroid stream in space. So you get a, a sense on what it's looked like. So so try and click Jasmine on the set on that one. Yeah, go for that one. Yeah. We've actually disabled that for some time. Yeah, oh, okay. it's not like that, right, that so feature's not working. <laughs> it will come back. Um, and it takes you to a website that shows the, the stream in space, which is really um, not a computer simulation. It's really our data being visually displayed. It's each orbit we measured is shown in space. And I think that helps a great deal too in sort of figuring out um, what show you're looking at. But, uh, turn the, the sphere south, go to the southern hemisphere. So we've done a lot of work in the southern hemisphere. So some of these showers, they are marked. I see one is in, in orange there. Um, I, I'm, I'm at a loss at the constellations. I, I recognize Canis Major, um, but, uh, but, but then what the other ones are called is, uh, is unfortunately beyond me. Uh, but people in the southern hemisphere will know, know that exactly. And uh, and those showers have now come for the first time in view that you can actually, you know, sh uh, see that they are there. Um, there are incredibly cool showers. Uh, we had uh, one particular nice shower in um, on New Year's Eve of 2015, I think, or New Year's Eve. I think it showed up again in 2020. So go to um, December 31st, 2020. You can also type in the date. Okay, I'm I'm already clicking, so I'm just that's gonna... okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is. You see that blue blob show up? That blue blob is actually nature's New Year's Eve fireworks. It's a shower that shows up only you know once every couple of years, but when it shows up, there's suddenly these nice bright meteors in the sky. Um, that sort of uh, herald the new year. Uh, it's really it's in a very small constellation called Volans, the flying fish. It was named by a Dutch cartographer, which is, uh, and so, you know, he was fascinated by these fishes that fly and, uh, and he, he assigned one to the, to the Southern Hemisphere constellations. And that's it, this is it. And it's one of very few uh, meteor showers that comes from, um, from this, um, this uh, pieces for land, this, <laughs> Flying fish constellation, and so it's called the Fallen Tits. Um, it's uh, it's just you know one of these fun showers to go watch watch for. Um, when we see this show up in our cams data, we usually put out a story saying go watch it's it's there. And uh, if you you know see it see it pop up as uh, with points, then uh, next night you can probably still see it. So it's 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 visible for for a few nights. Uh, this one. Uh, and, but and, it, it's, uh, and it's not every year. It's just occasionally it shows up. And when Peter sends us a notification and, and lets us know that there's something to watch, check out our social media and make sure you kind of you follow us because we'll let yeah. you we'll post that and let you know as well. So there is uh, there is interesting things going on in the sky. There is this sort of annual activity that's there every year. And then there are unusual showers. And uh, for the real meteor observers among us, it's a sport to see these unusual meteor showers. I mean, it's a notch on your, in your stick if you can say, I saw the volunteers. Now, I've never seen the volunteers. I'm not living in the Southern Hemisphere. But um, 
but the people in Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa, and so on, the media, they they uh, they can see the shower, and it's you know very cool if uh, you can say, I did that, I saw that. So so Peter, uh, we're winding down here. What's what's next for Cams? What's in the future for the project and for the website? So so the the biggest effort in the last. Uh, uh, for the, over many years, and especially when we expanded into the Southern Hemisphere in 2019, the last few years, has been to map our annual meteor showers. So we have an overview of what showers are out there in the sky, so we know which ones are. We like to know, we like to find out what the parent bodies are, which with comet is responsible, with asteroid is responsible. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's been the core effort. I'm wrapping all that up, I'm working on a, on a book that gives an overview of all the showers we've discovered. And I can tell you it's going to be close to 500 major showers that are now uh, with all these efforts uh, being documented. And it includes some showers that are seen by uh, by radars. So that's uh, another topic for a future satellite. Oh, yeah, but, we'll uh, definitely have to have you uh, back for that. Our effort. Now, the future is about monitoring what's going on in the sky. Because uh, these showers, like the politics, they're not just cool, they're also uh, of some concern to satellite operators. You know, there is, there are satellites in space are uh, exposed to these really fast moving uh, little specks of, of dust. And uh, as you've seen with this James Webb telescope, they get hit, everything gets hit by meteoroids. And uh, the ones we see as shooting stars are actually pretty big as far as meteors go. They are, they are relatively, uh, you know, still millimeter size, centimeter size particles. But um, if they hit a satellite, then uh, that creates some, some problems. And so satellite operators want to know about that. Um, we also uh, learn a lot from these showers uh, by detecting these <laughs> major streams. Like, for exa example, the volunteers, we don't know what uh, comet or asteroid is responsible, but we do want to find out. We do want to know. That is there. We know we'll find this object, because if the meteors come close to the Earth, then so can perhaps the comet. And uh, we want to know its history. So when did this comet uh, let go of all this debris? When was when was this meteor stream created? And for that, we're just collecting more and more data. We're hoping to see these showers come back every year. We've already seen a very interesting thing about some meteor showers, and that um, that's that meteoroids tend to get trapped in resonances. So they, they tend to move in orbits that sort of uh, go in ratios with that of Jupiter. So Jupiter goes around once, then the meteors goes around twice or three mm -hmm. times. But that sort of thing happens, and they're in fairly stable orbits, and they seem to be able to uh, you know, survive for a while. And um, a bunch of our sort of light like volatiles, our you know, unusual showers, come from that, that sort of mechanism. And so we're, like, we're trying to sort of figure out these, these dynamic processes that are going on in the solar system. And while doing all this, we are populating the solar system with meteor streams. First time, we are sort of getting a, a sense of you know what streams are out there, and uh, you know just like there are asteroids, just like there are comets, there is also such a thing as a meteor stream. And, you know, the way you see these meteor streams is as shooting stars. Uh, otherwise, uh, they are pretty invisible, pretty hard to detect. But uh, when they hit the Earth's atmosphere, suddenly you know it has consequences. And the same with satellites in orbit. When they hit the satellite, these little specks of dust carry a lot of kinetic energy. Your your microphone is fading somehow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll put it a little closer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm gonna bring I'm gonna bring the rest of our, our group on screen here so we can say thank you to everybody. So thank you to Amartya and Sahadri and Siddha and Chicheng, Peter. Thank you all of you for joining me today and talking about this new website. I am, I am having fun playing with it and, and definitely will be using it to sort of map out where stuff is. Um, and for anybody who has the question, it was mentioned earlier, but I just want to make it very, very clear. If you find a meteor shower, if you, if you discover it in all of this data, you, you, don't, you don't get to name it anything terribly exciting. It really is named after the constellation and the star that it's closest to. So do let us anybody... know if you see something unusual in our data because it yes. usually takes me a while to to find it. But do let us know. So um, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. So are are you all going to be continuing working on the website in the future? Yeah. 
Well, I, I know, I know, Sita is Sita, Sita is is tied to this website at this point. But but the rest <laughs> of Cha Chang Amartya, are you all yeah. still working on this? Yeah, of Certainly. course. Yeah. There are a few more works that are still remaining, uh, which are background work. Uh, all right. Well, it's it's something to be proud of, and thank you very much because it's it's just lovely, and this really uh, sort of makes the site usable for for everybody and understand yeah. for everybody and that's that's really uh, that's really fantastic it's 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 really cool to be able to to share scientific data with with the public and so you guys have made this process so much easier than it than it was before and that's fantastic so thank you everybody for all of your hard work um thank you peter for this project uh without which i would probably not be sitting here talking to y'all today so um and uh Thank you everybody for watching and joining us. As a reminder, the SETI Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit. If you enjoy our outreach, please uh, consider going to our website, uh, SETI.org and clicking on the Give Now button so that you can support this outreach and that we can keep doing these fabulous shows for you. Um, also, we have a newsletter you can sign up for when you go there and you can get all of the information straight to your email box, including uh, when Peter puts out those alerts on the showers that are interesting to go out and take a look at. So uh, the website is meteorshowers, plural.seti.org. Um, there is a link in both the show notes and uh, in the comments. So if you want to go and, and hunt that down there, that's where that will be. You can check out the VOD, of course, um, on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch. And I believe it hangs out on LinkedIn as well. So all of those will still be available for you to go back and look at. And we will be back next Thursday with another SETI Live still being determined. So stay tuned, everybody, and come back and join us. And thank you to all our guests one more time. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you.